Who is the primordial one? What is the eternal throne of the heavens? What the heck happened to Enkanomiya? And why is Enkanomiya's lore so forbidden? Now I've been slowly digesting all this new lore and terminologies and new names and titles and have slaved away at reading every new book in Enkanomiya. Finally piecing together exactly what happened to Enkanomiya as well as the one god that governed over it and why it's forbidden to talk about literally anything related to it to the outside world of Teyvat. And what better way than to use the books that they themselves forbade? Stop right there, criminal son. Hey guys, what's up, Aru? And welcome to another video. Been a while, hasn't it? This time it's gonna be about Fanes, also known as the Primordial One, the Sky Kingdom of Old Enkanomiya, the First and Second Heavenly War, and everything else leading to the fall and ultimate fate of Enkanomiya that we see today. This whole video discussion is going to be about the forbidden book before the sun and moon first, while cleaning up some of the gaps and plot holes using the other forbidden books. At the end of this video, I'm going to add my own point of view and theory as well. This video is going to be a lore dump, so I suggest reading your books and be sure to complete all the quests in Enkanomiya before watching. When the doves held branches and on fanes, the primordial one. Starting off, the primordial one is what's called the progenitor god of humanity. It was the god that came to the world of Teyvat long before humans even existed. This primordial god had four shining shades, which I'll talk about in a bit. First, at that time, the rulers of the old world were the seven sovereign dragon lords. If you didn't know, the seven sovereign dragon lords were basically the forefathers of the bishops that we see today. And it all starts with a battle of those gods. The primordial one was believed to be called Fanes, and that he possessed four shining shades of himself. For lack of photographic description, I will use Fanes from Greek mythology who is both androgynous and had nearly the same origin story. Fanes, or the primordial one in Genshin, was said to be born from an egg with characteristics of having a crown and wings upon it. Similarly, the Greek Fanes was also born from what's called the Cosmic Egg, being born with characteristics of a helmet instead of a crown and had broad golden wings. The only difference being that Genshin's Fanes had four shining shades of itself while the Greek Fanes didn't. So now that I've given you guys a general picture of what Fanes would look like, we can move on. So that way, you can view Fanes as something like a human with wings rather than a dragon or like one of those eyes with wings. Makes it easier that way. Continuing with the story, in order for Teva to be created, the egg from which Fanes came from had to be broken down. But in contrast, what Fanes did was use the shells to separate the universe, air quotes, universe, from the microcosms of the world. Which, if using literal meanings here, possibly relates to separating the smaller populations of the world from the universe whatever the universe is. The word microcosm means a smaller population of a larger one, like a suburb or an avenue or a small village is a microcosm of a city. So it could basically mean to separate Teyvat from the heavens or maybe separate the world itself and the universe outside. Fanes in the old times of Teyvat was the one and only god at that time. There was no other gods. That's why it was called the primordial one. Just it and the seven sovereigns in a war for what's called the eternal throne of the heavens. Here the seven dragon lords fought against Fanes and this was also when Fanes started creating the four shining shades. After the battle, the seven sovereigns finally bent their knee to the primordial one. Fanes then made the heavens and earth for our quote unquote our sake. I'm pretty sure this refers to humans but you can tell me down in the comments later. One of the four shades of the primordial one also helped in making the world. Together, they created the seas and oceans, the beasts and animals, the forests and rivers, and they basically created the land of Teyvat that we know today. And lastly, they created humans. And they made a lot of humans. And these humans, to your surprise, were once the people of Enkanomiya. And at that time, everybody in Teyvat lived as one single nation. No separate regions, no separate rulers or archons, and no other gods. There was no Kanria either, because this nation, the primordial nation is older than everything else. It is as I said the primordial nation with just the primordial humans and the primordial one with its four 
shades. Primordial, primordial. If you don't believe me, this was said openly by Enjo, who if you remember was an Abyss Lecter. But remember that Kanria most likely didn't exist at this time, and really shouldn't exist at the time Enkanomiya and the Primordial One was still there. And with Enjo's sexy Abyss Lecter voice, he said that back then, no gods walked the earth and the whole land belonged to one civilization, or rather, one nation. Interestingly, his only mistake here being the primordial one not being mentioned. This is probably because Enjo and Kanria believe that Enkonomiya once lived autonomously without a god. Sadly for Enjo, we found the books before the Abyss Order could, and they will probably never know about it either. Back in old Enkonomiya, everything was good and happy for quite a long time. The humans and their god were all friends and were pretty chill. They even go so far as to call their nation the Sky Kingdom. People you meet in Enkanomiya, specifically Aberaku, the one who made the huge light bulb, calls it the Sky Kingdom, that which possibly relates to the Kingdom of Celestia. But this older Sky Kingdom was ruled by the Primordial One and maybe not the gods of Celestia. We actually don't know if it was Celestia that Fanes made as heaven or not, so I'll use the word maybe. But the Primordial One had one rule. If the humans wanted to prosper, they should never succumb to temptation. But the author of the book also said that the path to temptation was already sealed. So whether or not the humans were already up to something, or had done something that Fanes didn't like, we can only leave it to theory, which I will not discuss. Yet. The Funerary Year So, to end this lovely reign of happiness, another heavenly throne came to Teyvat, and upon this second throne was a second god. People of the old times weren't too creative with names, so they just called this second god the second one who came. Okay, here's where the new war between Fanes, the primordial god, and the second one started, marking the second war for the heavenly throne. And this is also when the war was so destructive, it tore apart the world of Teyvat so much that the Sky Kingdom of the old Enkonomiya fell beneath the ocean floor. And from there, a new era began or a new year began, which was a year or era where humans didn't have gods. The first three years of darkness. The Dark Era. This was when Enkanamiya was at the mercy of the deep ocean. It was also when they found out that they were neighbors with the Dragon Lord's children, the Dragonairs of the Depths, commonly known as Baptismal Bishops. For some time, the people of Enkanamiya lived while the darkness of the ocean and the bishops were dangerously at their tail. All they could do at the time was pray and wait for the answers of the Primordial Ones and the Four Shades. Over time, the prayers slowly became cries for help because no one was answering their call all except for one, the shining shade known as the ruler of time. The Ankanomians gave her, quote unquote her, multiple names such as Okami Tokoyo, God of Moments, and even the name Kairos, the God of Time. Her real name, however, they never say, either because of fear of something, I don't know, or respect for the God itself. And her real name is called Astaroth. Now don't get this mixed up with Astaroth just yet because we're trying to stick with Genshin Impact's lore, specifically the Primordial One and the Four Shades. This is also where I have to remind you guys that the Primordial One is not Astaroth and is not the God of Time. The Primordial One is the big boy that had the God of Time as one of its shades, likely, as well as the three other shades with names that we don't know yet. I say likely for Astaroth because the Primordial One had four shades and when the people of Enkanomiya were crying for help, it stated that the Primordial One and the three of its shades didn't answer because they themselves know that Astaroth or the God of Time would be the one to answer their prayers. The Year of Blindness and the Year of the First Sun and Moon At some point in time in the every night of Enkanomiya, Abraku or Abrax the Sage was opened up to by the wisdom of the God of Time, which is Astaroth and not the Primordial One, which is Fanes. And with the wisdom of the God of Time, Abaraku was able to make the Mikoshi Dainichi, which is this thing, big light bulb. The people of Enkanomiya were now away from the threats of the bishops, but not to the threats of man's greed, which left the human nobles of Enkanomiya hungry for power, which then moves us to the second year of sun and moon. Once they had taken care of the bishops, 
They then wanted to find a way back up to Teyvat. Once they found this entrance to go back up, to their surprise, they were stopped by Fames, the Primordial One. Realizing that, they knew that the Primordial One was a victor and had beaten the second one that came. The Primordial One then laid down a ban, preventing the people of Enkanomiya from entering Teyvat. Here's where you might start to ask me, but Aru, why were they banned from coming back up? We really don't know specifically what it was. It could be because the humans broke their one rule, which is to give in to temptation, whatever that was, or because they wanted to rule themselves, or maybe because they did something before they fell, maybe because they were more inclined to following Easteroth, the god of time, instead of Fanes, the primordial one. But at present, right now, we don't know yet. The gapped year of the sun and moon. So quick disclaimer, this chapter of the video is further explained by doing the quest Hyperion's Dirge. So after they were banned from entering the surface, the corrupt nobles who were hungry for power seized control of the Daini Chimikoshi by making the artificial sun into a god. They then used the children born after the creation of the artificial sun and started calling them sun children. This was when humanity's greed led to puppet god children being manipulated by the heinous plots of the corrupt nobles. The sun children were basically used as political puppets for the masses by the nobles. Much like when the old nobles of old Mondstadt used young maidens to be given to other corrupt nobles. Which is weird because why are everything about nobles evil? But in Enkanomiya, once the children were at a certain age, they were quote unquote offered to the Dainichi Mikoshi. This was a ploy to keep the children from becoming mature and finding out the truth of the corrupt noble folk's greed. And sometime after that, the Sun Children, who were controlled by the corrupt nobles, imprisoned Abiraku. After which there wasn't anything said for the next 8 years until the 10th year of Sun and Moon. And in the 10th year of the Sun and Moon is where the book ends with the author writing that he has sufficiently written all the important events before the sun and moon. Then abruptly and ultimately ends the book, his final words being Hark, I hear armor without. Here I shall stop writing. He basically heard guards nearby and stopped writing the book. Now if you haven't noticed already, the book included three parables which I wanted to explain separately to keep the timeline of the book free of gaps and random plot holes. First is the parable of the sun. This first parable is basically an analogical story about Abaraku the sage and the people of Enkanomiya. After Abaraku made the Dainichi Mikoshi, some people wanted to be in control and use the sun children to do what can only be described as a coup d'etat over Abaraku. The second parable is a continuation after the death of Abaraku, which is the parable of the Lathed Lotus. This second parable is a mix of the Lotus Eater's world quest related to Spartacus, the leader of the resistance against the Sun Children, and the real Lotus Eaters from Odysseus's adventures, which is a actual book in real life. The word Lathed means forgetful, and the relation of Genshin's Lotus Eaters with Odysseus is almost uncanny in that the Lotus in Genshin and Odyssey's context were both narcotics that made people very calm and also made them forget their families and homes. But the main difference here is that Odysseus was there to stop his crew, while the Enkanomians, who were the resistance group, didn't have Spartacus to stop them because Spartacus was already imprisoned by the Sun Children and the remaining members of the resistance group were left to one skint broke. They had no money. <laughs> Basically, they <laughs> were broke. Okay, <clears throat> so the only way they could make money was by selling the Lethed Lotus, known as the Dragon Bone Orb. At the same time, while they were selling it, they were probably also ingesting and using some of it, which eventually and ultimately ended the resistance. A pretty simple change in plot, but leads to quite a sad end. Finally, we have the Parable of the Tree, which is about a king, a spiritual tree, a gardener who loves the tree, and the king's priest. So far, it doesn't have a relation to real-life reference stories that I know of, and the way the story is told seems to entail something that happened long ago. It's also interesting that the same 500 years are used yet again in this story. So the parable goes that the king for some reason wanted to repair the broken beams of his pavilion, but the spiritual tree was in the way of his repairs. So the king wanted to cut the tree down and remove it, but the gardener who was told to cut the tree 
fell in love with the tree's spirit. The, the tree's spirit, not the tree, okay? It's worth mentioning that the king was an incarnation of Fanes, the primordial one, which the gardener could not oppose because, well, he was the king. So the gardener went to the king's priest, who was the incarnation of the Tokoyo Okami, which is Easteroth, the god of time. Okay, th this is where I have to remind you guys again that Easteroth is not the primordial one and the primordial one is not the god of time because they are two different entities. Even though Easteroth is a shade of the primordial one, they are still different entities. So having said this, the priest advised the gardener to cut the branches first and then cut the tree entirely. The priest then tells the gardener to plant the branches in the ground. The gardener cried because the tree spirit would take 500 years to grow. Air quotes 500 years. The priest then said, and I quote, Your one thought shall echo through eternity. End quote. I honestly don't know what that means and neither would the gardener probably. Anyway, after the gardener planted the trees in his backyard and not the king's yard because the king wouldn't want that, the branches grew instantly into a full-on tree. And with this new tree, the spirit within it was a continuation of the previous tree. The parable ended with a remark that Isaroth was able to take seeds from that moment, air quote seeds and moment, and then bring it with her to the past or the future. Because the god of time can take those quote unquote seeds from those quote unquote moments and then bring it with her to the past or the future of Enkanomiya. Hence the different sin shades that you see of Abaraku and everyone else who could remember what happened in Enkanomiya. Here's where I'm going to start talking about theory. And my theory is that Fanes after the second heavenly war needed to repair the broken beams of its land, which is the heavenly land. The broken beams being either a structural beam for the heavenly land or an analogy for one of the shades. Or maybe something that he had that was very important broke. I'm basically using metaphors to symbolize a structural beam's importance in the parable and why the king wants it repaired. Meaning that he lost something important when he needed to repair the beams. And the spiritual tree honestly is only up for speculation at this point. Whatever the tree was and whatever the new tree happened to have, I can only theorize that it was something related to the god of woods that died 500 years ago and the quick birth of the new Dendro Archon. Because well, trees. But I could be entirely wrong here, so again, as many times as I've said, we don't know. There you have it, everything we can find from the creation story of the world of Teyvat. And that is only first of the five books of the Forbidden Collection. The other books aren't about the creation of the world, but rather about the creations of humans after they were left to their own devices. Which is in and of itself very interesting, considering they experimented on Vishaps to make new breeds of Vishaps. And scarily enough, they find out that they can make human-dragon hybrids. Like what the fuck is Kokomi a dragon? But that's gonna be for another video. Interestingly, the hilly churls of Teyvat today regard the word Unu, which means one, as a holy word that relates to God as well as their origins of life. And Unu is also used to describe seeds, relating it to the god of time, Easteroth, and the primordial one, where the time is related to seeds and gods are related to the number one, makes it very interesting because it could mean that the hilly churls were once the people of Enkanomiya. But that's just theory, so <laughs> maybe. Anyway, that's basically everything about the Primordial One, its four shades, and the events that happened in Enkanomiya. This is also going to be the end of my video. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to my ramblings again. Like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell icon to stay updated to my videos. So I'll see you guys later, yeah?